This webinar is on laser diffraction. It's part of our modern particle characterization technique series where we're going to be walking through various modern particle characterization techniques. The presenter today is Julie Chen Nguyen, and she, she's organized our webinar series, and some of you may know her from that. Uh, she's one of our particle science liaisons. And I, I, I found out that she considered becoming a dentist for a while. Imagine, well, at least I'm thankful she did led here in particle analysis. I'm sure your kids are thrilled that they, 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 their mom is not a dentist. <laughs> yes, they are. You would never imagine. <laughs> So Julie has a number of years' experience in particle characterization and a few other lab techniques, has been in our applications lab for quite a while. She really comes to add this from a very practical point of view. So I suppose with that introduction, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the introduction. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, cool. So because I've been facilitating for a while, um, I know there are a few common questions that um, always come in. So I want to let you know that we've put together a seven part series um, on, on modern particle characterization techniques, um, covering particles in the subvisible range all the way up to the millimeter range. Like Jeff said, um, every webinar will be recorded and posted on our website, so you can watch it whenever you want in whichever order you want. Just make sure that you sign up for our newsletter and stay tuned for the webinar on dynamic light scattering in July, which I believe, Jeff, you're doing that one, correct? Yes, yes, I'm doing dynamic light scattering. In between, we have some specialist webinars on nanoparticle tracking, exosomes, and online image analysis. That would be interesting for folks interested in shape. Uh, multi-particulates next, next month. Yeah. Watch our newsletter. It tells you everything's going to happen. Yeah. So you're here for the laser diffraction portion of the series. It's not in order, so you definitely don't need to watch the intro to understand what laser diffraction is. I will discuss with you the basics of laser diffraction techniques, specifically the difference between me and Fraunhofer and when to use which. The instrument that carry out the theories will then go into the importance of sampling and dive straight into wet and dry analysis, case studies, method development with pre-recorded demo videos. We'll wrap up with a brief discussion on how to select the best refractive index, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So let's begin with a very quick definition from NIST. Any condensed phase tridimensional discontinuity in a dispersed system may generally be considered as a particle. Uh, for example, droplets in an emulsion or solids dispersed in a liquid. An aggregate may also be regarded as a particle. So what that really means is a particle can be a fragment, a piece, or a sliver of a matter. For example, coronavirus is a particle um, many coronaviruses trapped in a droplet is also a particle. So though we haven't directly encountered coronavirus in the laboratory space, we have looked at virus particles and size distribution and concentration of the viruses to understand virus infectivity and its therapeutic effect. Particle size is also important for other applications too, such as chocolate. So chocolate particles affect how we perceive the texture when chocolate melts in our mouth at 37 degrees Celsius body temp. Particles that are larger than 30 microns are generally deemed as gritty and cheap. So manufacturers often look at particle size to quality control their process. Coffee is another great example. Um, you'll hear that grinder is more important than the roast because coffee particles affect the brewing process and its flavor. Those particles less than 100 micron usually gives you that bold, bitter flavor and contributes to that oil foam that you see on top of your espresso brew. Particles also dictate your mouthfeel or shelf life of the milk whether you're talking about dairy or non-dairy. For industrial applications such as battery, raw material can affect its power. Cement particle size dictates its compaction. Particle size and size distribution also determine the reflectivity of the center lane divider, as inside of these dividers are filled with controlled bead size. So hopefully by now, 
I convinced you that particle size is important, regardless of what sector you're from. If you don't know the size of the material you're working with, and you just know that they're too small for rulers or calipers, laser diffraction is usually a good starting point. Okay, so the technique is straightforward. Um, it is based on the concept that particles will scatter light in all directions with an intensity value that's proportional to its size and inversely proportional to its angle. So, for example, a uh, large particle will scatter light very strongly at a smaller angle, whereas a small particle would scatter light weakly at a wider angle. So after the light is scattered, um, the analyzer's job is to use lots of detectors over a range of angles and convert that scattering data into a size distribution. Our job as the operator is to not overload the analyzer with too much sample, um, and it's an effect known as multiple scattering. So generally what happens there is you overload the sample so much that the light bounces off of many other particles before it gets to the detectors. So the analyzer would then interpret the signal as one that's coming from a small one, and then will shift the distribution size to a lower size bin. We'll talk about what the optimal sample load or particle concentration in the later slides, but I just wanna bring this to your awareness. Okay, so in order to understand the difference between me and Fraunhofer theories, we need to see what happens when light strikes a particle that's very small. Light can be reflected, it can be refracted, it can be absorbed and then re-radiated, or it can be diffracted by the contour of the particle. Fraunhofer theory simplifies the whole phenomenon and say, okay, when the light illuminates a particle, only diffraction matters. I'll only consider diffraction. And this is fine um, since diffraction becomes a dominant factor when the particle is very large. Me theory, on the other hand, um, takes account of how light is diffracted. It also looks at the degree of refraction and absorption. So for that reason, me theory offers a better solution for the complete particle scattering pattern, especially for medium to small particles. So it's really your choice whether to use von Hoffer or me theory, just stay consistent. So here's our little summary cheat sheet. For von Hoffer approximation, it assumes that the particles are opaque, they're 2D circular disks, and that the particle is much larger than the wavelength of light. Von Hoffer is an approximation, but generally you can get away using it because it gives you a similar result as me theory if you know that all of the particles in your sample are larger than 50 microns. Me theory assumes that particles are spherical, but since it takes account of bending and absorption of the light, you'll need to have an idea of the type of material working with before measuring. So what happens if you have needle-shaped particles? Particle shape is often overlooked, but is super important. Um, I would say please refer to the webinar title, Interpreting Laser Diffraction Results for Non-Spherical Particles. There you'll see what happens if you have a needle shaped particles or particles that are not perfect spheres. Okay, quick example here comparing me and Fraunhofer. We measure a commercially available glass bead standard using provided protocol. We measure the beads, apply two different calculations, and then overlay to compare. Me theory gave us the right answer with a median of, or D50, of 13.5 micron. And I know that's right because that's what it says on the certificate. Whereas Fraunhofer approximation gave me a bimodal distribution with one centering around three micron and the other around 20 micron. So you can see that it tends to fail, Fraunhofer approximation uh, tends to fail when particles, all the particles are well below 50 microns. This is also a slide to show you the importance of using certified reference material before measuring to declare accuracy. Okay, so let's put all we just talked about into tangible practical terms. Here is an optical 
diagram of what's inside the LANX-60 laser diffraction unit. So it begins with a 650 nanometer laser on the right, passes through a projection lens, and then flow cell or some sort of sample handler to disperse your sample. The light is folded by a mirror and those light scattered in the near forward direction is captured by the ring detectors. You'll notice front and back scatter light sensors. They're positioned here to cover a full range of scatter light. For LNX-60, it goes up to 170 degrees. For those really, really small particles, the ONX-60 also has a second light source, the blue light at 405, degree, at 405 nanometer. This combination of blue and red is what gives you that full size spectrum from the nanometer range all the way up to the millimeter range without change of any optics. So what makes laser diffraction a modern technique? It is obviously a very mature technique, but you can see that we started in 1988 um, and we call it the LA500. We then began building improvements after improvements on, on, on top of each generation. So for instance, Ni-20 laser diffraction um, succeeded LA910 around the same time when Windows XP become, became avail unavailable. They switched to Windows 7 and improved its graphical user interface. So that gave us the leeway to improve our software as, as well. So that includes customizable report uh, or automatic laser alignment, just to name a few. And that same goes with the LNX-60. We've added the method expert wizard to help users of any experience level determine the best measurement method, including picking the best refractive index, which can be a topic of a zone, if you will. Hariba offers two modern laser diffraction models, the LA960 and the LA350. 960 is your high performance 10 nanometer to 5 millimeter size range analyzer. The LA350 is your compact portable version that goes from 0.1 micron to 1000 micron. The footprint of the LA350 is equivalent to um, a piece of tabloid sized paper. So it's about 11 times 17 inches. It's super small. And so for that reason, you'll often see multiple units, multiple LA350 across dairy or drilling fluid sites where mobility is very important. Both LA960 and 350 share the same user interface and the same use of, uh, ease of use though. So here are the accessories or the sample handlers um, for wet analysis. They're designed to work with different applications such as gels, paste, powder emulsions. So flow cell is the standard cell that works with the autofill function of NOAA 960. The sample is dispersed and circulated through the flow cell with a software control circulation and agitation speed. The MIDI flow is just like the flow cell, but it fills up only 35 mils of dispersant. And this is perfect, say, if you have very limited sample in hand. Fraction cell goes even lower, down to five to 15 mil. So fraction cells is essentially a cuvette fitted with a mini magnet disturb bar inside to keep your sample suspended. This is very suitable for very, very, very limited sample that and that the dispersant of choice is expensive or hazardous. So for example, if you're in a pharma arena, an example for fraction cell applications, API, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, we usually run them in hexane, something that's volatile and can be costly for repeated runs. So you'll wanna use fraction cell to minimize using as much dispersant as possible. Cleaning is easy with a Q-tip. You don't need a separate cleaning station. Pay cells and high concentration cells are good for applications such as chocolate and toothpaste. So what you're seeing right now is a changer table and it fits three different accessories in the LNX-60. So changing from one application to another is fairly easy. Accessories for dry is simple. So if you have large flowable materials, you can let the particles free fall by gravity through the measurement window, and then it gets collected by the vacuum. 
If you have fine, loosely agglomerated materials, there are three different nozzles and a range of air pressures to choose from to help disperse the sample. I do find that this medium nozzle covers most of the applications out there. Here is a flow chart of general procedure for particle analysis, again from NIST. You can see that half of the steps listed by NIST focus on sampling, and it's because a representative sample is the key to drawing any scientific conclusions. If your subsample is a representative aliquot, you'll get a non-representative measurement result. This is especially true if you have broad size dis distribution or particles larger than 100 microns. The sampling process is seemingly easy, but it can be overlooked. So I would say please take a look at the Particle Classroom Series 5, specifically on sampling and dispersion. Just to give you an idea of how devastating it can be if you neglect sampling, here we use 60% coarse and 40% fine sand binary mixture as an example. Conan quartering technique by itself without operator errors or instrument error of any introduces close to 7% of relative standard deviation whereas spinning riffling tightens the deviation down to 0.146%. So whenever possible, we always recommend that you riffle the sample down to the desired sample size. All right, here, let's start the wet analysis video. So you feed, you set the circulation speed to three and agitation, and now you want to align the laser. You want to hit blank to subtract any background noise or residual debris in the system. And now you're ready to add the sample. Here, you're looking at um, latex standard, you're getting added drop by drop until the concentration is within that blue zone. And this is how we avoid modal scattering as discussed before. Now you click measure. And now you have a measurement result display in a separate screen. Lastly, click rinse and have your system clean automatically for the next run. This whole entire sequence can be programmed so you don't have to click multiple times. So that was a very brief wet analysis demo video. Let's move on to case study. Um, our first case study is mayonnaise in oil and water emulsion. I want to begin with emulsion because it's probably one of the easier applications where you can just disperse and then run. The only thing to watch out for when you're working with emulsions is to use a lower pump speed to avoid disruption of droplets. So, mayonnaise can be prepared in many different ways, but the four basic components will remain the same. You need an oil of your choice, that's your dispersed phase, um, something acidic like vinegar, and that's your continuous phase, and egg yolk as the emulsifier that holds the dispersed and continuous phase together, and then you want to add salt for taste. So depending on where you're from, here in California, which is where I'm from, we have a lot of health conscious consumers who want to stick with healthier fat, such as extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, or almond oil, instead of the traditional canola oil that most mayonnaise products use. Some people may have special plant-based diet restrictions too, so they don't want to have eggs inside. So there's definitely a growing pressure on manufacturers to create some sort of new mayonnaise products or mayonnaise equivalent. But here's the tricky part. When you substitute canola oil that's a little bit more viscous than avocado oil, the cholesterol content may decrease, but now you are changing the sensory characteristics since avocado oil is thinner than canola oil. And if you take the egg out, of mayonnaise and replace it with soy or pea proteins, now you're changing the emulsion stability. So it's definitely a challenge to strike a balance while maintaining the same taste and mouthfeel. Well, it turns out 
that one effective way to maintain consumer acceptance is by monitoring the particle size of the mayonnaise emulsion. So to determine the optical size range that mimics the real mayonnaise, we must start with measuring one. So I went out to buy an iconic jar of regular mayonnaise, you know, the kind with the blue lid and the blue label, and we all know it, we've probably all had it growing up, and I threw it in the LNX60. That's the one in green, green, and I label it as generic regular mayonnaise. I then went to Whole Foods, and then I asked the staff which mayonnaise alternatives were more popular. So they suggested I pick up avocado oil, mayo, and a another brand, a popular eggless vegan mayo. And they cost four times as much as the regular mayonnaise um, for this, this experiment. All three samples were then measured in deionized water with a refractive index of 1.49, which I looked up, and a imaginary component of 0.001i. Their results are overlaid on top of each other, as you can see here for comparison, and all three sample exhibit a single peak distribution. Regular mayonnaise in green gave me a mean size of about 10.9 micron. Avocado is in red, and it gave me about 30 microns, and the popular vegan mayo is in black, and it's about 10 micron for the mean size. You can see that the ideal size range is highlighted here. It's for mayonnaise. It's about a mean size of 10 to 13 micron with popular vegan mayo matching best with the regular mayonnaise with eggs in it. So that was great. Now let's take a look at another eggless vegan mayo, which I named as generic vegan mayo. Since it was so much cheaper, I just, I, I just wonder why. I can't say no to it. So I bought it and right away when I opened it, I was able to tell that its, its consistency is different from the from the regular mayonnaise or the popular vegan mayonnaise. It was more like jello, um, it was less creamy and it has visible lumps. I ran it with the same measurement parameters in LNA60 anyway, and here I found in green a bimodal distribution with a mean size that's five times as much as uh, five times bigger than its competitor. So takeaway message here, if you get the particle size distribution right, you can probably charge four times more if people will still buy it. Okay, the second case study is piezo electric particles or short for PZT particles. Piezo electricity was discovered in 1880. It has an interesting property where uh, mechanical stress induces electric charges, and electric charge induces mechanical expansion and contraction of the material. So for, for that reason, PZT powders are often pressed into discs, and we exploit its unique property in applications such as ultrasound or dry powder inhalers. So where does particle size comes in? PZT processing often leads to particle aggregation, and that leads to poor compaction from powder to disc, just like cement. And that lowers the performance of the end product and increased protection cost. So it is important to monitor the particle size throughout the process for quality control. So here we have a customer sample, lead oxide, that was sent in to us. It came in a small bag of powder and the sample submission form and it also has an expected size range that's a lot less than 100 microns. Supposedly, as discussed before, if it's 100, less than 100 microns, I shouldn't have to worry about sampling, but with visual inspection, I saw larger lumps, so I riffled the sample anyway. A single shot of, of representative aliqua was then transferred directly from the riffler into the LNA60 until I hit the appropriate concentration in that blue zone, if you remember from the demo video, which is about 80 to 95% transmittance or 5 to 10% of obscuration. I also use about 0.1 weight percent of surfactants, sodium pyrophosphate, um, to lower the, surf the surface tension. The resultant measurement gave me two separate peaks with a gap in between. This is quite unusual. You don't typically see this kind of distribution profile unless if you have two different sample types in one sample set. So what now? 
Now let's take a look at method development for this specific sample. Unlike emulsions like mayonnaise or milk, powders can clump together during processing or during transport. So we need to apply some energy to sonicate and break them apart, but we don't want to break the particles. So here I set the sample, the system to measure lead oxide five consecutive times before sonication, during sonication, and then after sonication. My job here is to closely monitor the D10, D50, D90, the purple D10 and D50 green and pink D90, and stop applying sonication when the trend has stabilized or plateaued. Running fire repeats also gives me information on repeatability. So now you can see that the first five runs before sonication was sort of over the place. And this is probably because of that handful of large particles in the sample. As it flows through the flow cell, it gets detected or not. And again, it gets detected and back down until I put in one minute of sonication energy where D10, D50, and D90 are finally stabilized with the standard deviation that's well within the ISO recommended range. So that tells me that the particles are now fully dispersed and then take an average of it and gives me a final result. So this measurement parameters can be saved and then reused for future use. You don't have to do this method development exercise every single time. A quick summary for method development, watch out for sampling, look for wetting if necessary to lower surface tension, and then investigate the effect of energy, sonication energy on size, and then make sure that you are within the sample concentration range, typically 80 to 85 is a good starting point. And then measurement time, if you have a very, very polydispersed or wide distribution, you may want to increase that and pump and stirring speed. Typically three and two will be enough. Okay, now I'm gonna play the dry analysis demo video. Here we go. So align the laser to the optical detector range. Blank, and now you can measure by adding an aliquot of your sample to the shoot, just like what you see right here. Close the lid. And now click measure. And when you click measure, vacuum and air pressure are, are automatically turned on, ready for the sample to move down the, the dry unit. The result is immediately displayed on a screen. And that's it. You can see that dry is a very simple process compared to wet. So now going into dry, we'll use powdered sugar as our case study for dry method development as it's easier to measure powdered sugar at its natural state, which is dry, than to find an appropriate dispersant that won't dissolve the powder. It is also a great example because there's already a clearly defined industry standard in public domain. So I sort of just pull it out. For example, the sample used in this case study is grade 10X and it's defined as all the particles, 98% of the particles are less than 200 mesh, or in another word, 98% of the particles are smaller than 74 microns. The production goal here is to efficiently mill crystals into a rather narrow distribution. The narrower the distribution, the higher the uniformity, and the better the performance when it comes to mixing. So powder sugar also clump together very quickly. So up to about 3% of anti-caking agent is usually added for flowability. So similar to lead oxide, um, some sort of energy is needed to disperse the particles. So we'll perform a pressure size titration test to determine the best air pressure. So here I set the system to measure three consecutive times instead of five. Three is enough per ISO 13320. So three times at four bar, three bar, two bar, one bar, and then again at no air pressure. You can see that the pink is the change of air pressure and D10 is in blue, purple is D50, and green is D90. My job here is to closely monitor the D10, D50, and D90 and watch for a stable region. So 
I determine in this example that the stable region is at three bar. I then take an average of that three runs and you see a distribution down here and it tells me that 98.7% of the particles are less than 74 microns. And this is a type of thing that you can readily do within the software. It can, you can set the software to read results like sieves. Okay, so cheat sheet for method development dry. Sampling is usually a bigger deal for dry particles. Make sure that you always take a look at the pressure size titration test to determine the best air pressure. Save your parameters and then you can reuse the same parameters for the future run. So I added the slide in here. It's a little bit tricky, but it's doable. Can wet and dry dispersion agree? And the answer is yes, but you have to go in with an expectation that dry and wet will not match perfectly. So here you are looking at dry cement on top. You can see that an average D50 is about 11.2 microns, whereas in wet, you're looking at 11.7 micron. And that's the degree of variance that you can sort of expect for the specific sample. Now let's go to everybody's favorite topic, how to select the appropriate optical properties. The real component of your refractive index, you should always assume that you know it. You can look it up through Google or you can measure it with a refractometer. Usually up to two decimal point at places is required. Imaginary component of the RI is usually established by experience, but know that practically an imaginary component and, uh, and value larger than zero is required to accommodate for surface roughness. Zero I is usually reserved for standards or emulsions. And you don't have to go so details into, you know, the decimal points where you change from 0.001 to 0.002. Usually zero, 0 0.001, 0 0.1, and 0.1, and one I are good options to choose from. So using PZT sample as an example, um, here is a screenshot of the method expert wizard that's built in in the LA960 software. I looked at the real component of the sample, which is 2.20. I then used the method expert to change the same measurement into five different imaginary components, 0, 0 0.1, 0, uh, 0.1, 1, and 2. I then look at the R parameter down here to see which RI value gives me a closer match between the calculated and measured scattering signals. The lower the R parameter, the better the agreement. So here you can see that one I or two is, are good choices. So concluding comments, anytime you're using laser diffraction, always look out for the repeatability, reproducibility, and the robustness. Repeatability by ISO definition means that you measure the same consecutive runs at least three times as seen in the wet and the dry case studies. You want to aim for a CV value of less than 3% for the D50 and less than 5% for D10 and D90. If your samples are less than 10 micron, go ahead and give, you, give, give yourself a little bit more grace and double that to 6 and 10. This is something that we can do automatically in the ONI 60. So you don't need to enter calculations, just simply say you want the CV value to be shown in your report. Reproducibility is also important. In terms of reproducibility, USP 420 gave, you the gave us the guideline that a CV value of less than 10% for D50 is deemed as good, 15% um, for D10 and D90, and again, double the value to 20 and 30% if you have particles greater than 10 microns. Okay, so I think that's about it. But we can definitely open the floor for any Q&A questions. Okay, so we actually did have some questions come in. Uh, can we determine the size distribution of a protein which exists in different oligomeric states? Yes, I would say so. So protein may be better for a different technique, such as nanoparticle tracking analysis. But I'd, I'd love to have your feedback too, Jeff. What do you think? Yeah, I would just bite my tongue because uh, really that's that's the question best aimed at dynamic light scattering because the size range of mm -hmm. proteins. And if you're looking at protein monomer dimer, 
It's a DLS question. Come back in July for my talk or get us up offline if you're interested in, in an analyzer. Okay, next question. Uh, how are lumps taken care of in particle size determination of dry samples? Okay, so lumps, there are two types of lumps. Some lumps are aggregated, which means that no energy can break it apart. They're chemically fused. And then there is the loosely uh, loose agglomerates. So what you can do is to put the sample through a pressure size titration test, changing the air pressure from four bar all the way down to zero to uh, to evaluate which, which air pressure is the best. We also have three different nozzle sizes to help the dispersion. Okay, so you beat them up with air. Uh, is the size distribution shown in today's talk, or I should rephrase it, are the size distributions shown in today's talk number weighted or volume weighted? Volume weighted. So laser diffraction is a technique that's based on volume weighted distribution. Okay, so here's one. I have an LA300, do I select the a relative refractive index in the software or just the particle refractive index? <laughs> this is a very good question. I think yeah. it's relative refractive index, which means you have to know the refractive index of your material and the medium. But Jeff, I can use your help on that, I think. Yeah, I, I don't remember what the, whichever analyzer you have, it, it tends to ask either for refractive index of particle and separately ask for refractive index of the medium or it asks for relative refractive index. When the analyzer asks for both, it just does the division for you automatically. All right, so can we send samples for analysis? <laughs> yes, absolutely. The answer is yes, um, but we would recommend that you send in, um, I guess, one to three distinct samples that would give you an idea of what you're working with. So as Julie states, we have Applications Lab that supports our particle analyzer sales, so we can work with you on that. All right, what limits the smallest size of the particle that can be determined? The smallest size really depends on the refractive index. So the stronger your particle with scatter light, the smaller typically it can go down to. But for LNX60, we've measured 30 nanometer silica before, and that's really pushing the limit and when we say 30 nanometers, we're talking about the D50 with the tail that goes down even lower. So I would say 30 nanometer for the D50 is the smallest particle size for laser diffraction. Yeah, uh, so a couple with that. What would be the smallest refractive index difference between sample and solid? Ooh, that's a good question. Sometimes you don't get to choose, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, usually you want to increase that ratio um, as much as you can, but I I actually might have to come back to you on that. I don't know what the smallest relative refractive index is required to measure your sample accurately. Maybe we can take a look at it or discuss offline what specific sample you're referring to. Yeah, and how big are the particles? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So do you recommend using dispersant in samples with particles smaller than 10 microns, such as clays? Absolutely. When you have particles smaller than 10 microns, you do want a little bit more dispersing power, and that usually comes with wet analysis, where you have the circulation, you have the agitation, you have the ultrasonic energy available to disperse these agglomerates. What's the maximum heterogeneity of the sample that can be measured? Um, one of the widest, most heterogeneous polydispersed sample that we've measured was probably SAN. Um, so it goes from, uh, say, one micron, if not smaller, for the clay, all the way up to millimeter range for the rocks. So when you, if you're working with a very heterogeneous uh, sample set, just be sure that you allow the system to measure for enough amount of time to see all your samples through the flow cell. Okay, and for validation, can I use ISO 13, 1330 and USP 420? Um, 1330, is that I'm always thinking 1332. Uh, 1332 is for imagine, no, no, is for microscopy. 13320. Oh. Yes, yes, absolutely. 13320, and I think the revision for 2019 or 2020 is coming out soon, but it does detail how to validate the instruments in 
certain steps. And USP 420? Um, I'm not sure. Jeff, what do you say? Uh, well, I keep getting different numbers in my head somehow. So was it 419 was the USP for, I, yeah, so we, um, actually this might be something as we get into details, we can look it up and see. Yeah, I think USB 420, I just remember that it talks about reproducibility. I'm not sure what it says about the instruments. Yeah, okay. Uh, Hope that helps. Oh, uh, USB 429 is diffraction. Ah, uh, got it. Good to okay. know. Okay, uh, can we pull out the scattering form factor from the software? I believe not. I'm going to question, uh, which mayonnaise tasted best? I'm sorry, you broke off? Which what? Which, which mayonnaise tasted best? <laughs> so, I really like the popular vegan mayonnaise. <laughs> and then, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. honestly, my second favorite, well, actually, my most favorite is the Japanese mayonnaise. Japanese mayonnaise does not use the whole egg. They only put egg yolks in it. So you get that really bold flavor. And it also has a little bit of MSG, so it's tastier. <laughs> yes, I am a mayonnaise person. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. See, Californians re love to read labels. <laughs> I, I can tell. All right, well, I, I think um, we covered most of the questions and we're pretty much out of time so i want to julie thank you for the great presentation thank and thank you. everybody else for your attention and we look forward to seeing you either on our email newsletter or at the next webinar in our series thank you all thank you. all right bye for now bye